So let's dive straight into it. David writes, Figure 2.6 shows that roughly its actual size, a part of the pattern of shadows cast three metres from a pair of straight parallel slits in an otherwise opaque barrier. The slits are one-fifth of a millimetre apart and illuminated by a parallel-sided beam of pure red light from a laser on the other side of the barrier. Why laser light and not torchlight? Only because the precise shape of a shadow also depends on the colour of the light in which it is cast. White light, as produced by a torch, contains a mixture of all visible colours, so it can cast shadows with multi-coloured fringes. Therefore, in experiments about the precise shapes of shadows, we are better off using a light of a single colour. We could put a coloured filter, such as a pane of coloured glass, over the front of the torch so that only light of that colour would get through. That would help, but filters are not all that discriminating. A better method is to use laser light, for lasers can be tuned very accurately to emit light of whatever colour we choose with almost no other colour present. If light travelled in straight lines, the pattern in figure 2.6 would consist simply of a pair of bright bands one-fifth of a millimetre apart, too close to distinguish on this scale, with sharp edges and with the rest of the screen in shadow. But in reality, the light bends in such a way as to make many bright bands and dark bands and no sharp edges at all. If the slits are moved sideways, so long as they remain within the laser beam, the pattern also moves by the same amount. In this respect, it behaves exactly like an ordinary, large-scale shadow. Now what sort of shadow is cast if we cut a second identical pair of slits in the barrier interleaved with the existing pair so that we have four slits at intervals of one-tenth of a millimetre? We might expect the pattern to look almost exactly like figure 2.6. After all, the first pair of slits by itself cast the shadow in figure 2.6 and as I have just said, the second pair by itself would cast the same pattern, shifted about a tenth of a millimetre to the side in almost the same place. We even know that light beams normally pass through each other unaffected, so the two pairs of slits together should give essentially the same pattern again, though twice as bright and slightly more blurred. In reality though, what happens is nothing like that. The real shadow of a barrier with four straight parallel slits is shown in figure 2.7a. For comparison, I have repeated below it the illustration of the two slit pattern, figure 2.7b. Clearly, the four slit shadow is not a combination of two slightly displaced two slit shadows, but has a new and more complicated pattern. In this pattern, there are places such as the point marked X, which are dark on the four slit pattern, but bright on the two slit pattern. These places were bright when there were two slits in the barrier, but went dark when we cut a second pair of slits for the light to pass through. Opening those slits has interfered with the light that was previously arriving at X. So adding two more light sources darkens the point at X. Removing them illuminates it again. Pausing there, just my reflection. Now, at this point, I still uh, re recall, to some extent, the excitement of reading that. Even though I didn't know the explanation yet, I'd read that sort of thing before, but probably not quite as well explained exactly what the problem was. But this idea that if you open up more places for the light to come through, you actually decrease the amount of light on the screen. There's more shadows, even though you've got more light sources. You, you had two previously, two places for the light to come through, and you had a certain pattern of light and dark, and then you open up more places for the light to go through, more gaps, more slits, and you actually decrease the amount of light. You actually increase the number of shadows. This seems bizarre. It's like opening up more places for the light to get through darkens the screen. So this is really mysterious. And I, I don't know exactly what my psychology was back at the time of reading this, but, but I guess it might have been something like, I'm about to be given another confusing account of what's going on here. I'm not going to understand this. I've read about this before. I've even conducted this experiment myself before. And I've had lecturers tell me about you know, the results of the experiment and what it could mean, and I haven't understood anything about what's going on. So I, I guess I had, my hopes were pretty low <laughs> for being given a realistic account, a clear account, a logical account that I would be able to actually explain to other people. After all, that's a measure of whether or not you understand something. If you can actually explain it to someone else such that they then walk away nodding their head and going, oh, now I also get it, then that means to some extent that you understand it. At the very least, you've convinced yourself you understand it, even if you might have some misconceptions. 
Okay, so backtracking a little bit and reading on. David wrote, These places were bright when there were two slits in the barrier, but when dark, when we cut a second pair of slits for the light to pass through, opening those slits has interfered with the light that was previously arriving at X. So adding two more light sources darkens the point at X. Removing them illuminates it again. How? One might imagine two photons heading towards X and bouncing off each other, like billiard balls. Either photon alone would have hit X, but the two together interfere with each other so that they both end up elsewhere. I shall show in a moment that this explanation cannot be true. Nevertheless, the basic idea of it is inescapable. Something must be coming through that second pair of slits to prevent the light from the first pair from reaching X. But what? We can find out with the help of some further experiments. First, the four slit pattern of figure 2.7a appears only if all four slits are illuminated by the laser beam. If only two of them are illuminated, a two slit pattern appears. If three are illuminated, a three slit pattern appears, which looks different again. So whatever causes the interference is in the light beam. The two slit pattern also reappears if two of the slits are filled by anything opaque, but not if they are filled by anything transparent. In other words, the interfering entity is obstructed by anything that obstructs light, even something as insubstantial as fog, but it can penetrate anything that allows light to pass, even something as impenetrable to matter as diamond. If complicated systems of mirrors and lenses are placed anywhere in the apparatus, so long as light can travel from each slit to a particular point on the screen, what will be observed at that point will be part of a four slit pattern. If light from only two slits can reach a particular point, part of a two slit pattern will be observed there, and so on. So, whatever causes interference behaves like light. I'm just pausing there. What we mean by interference is something affecting that light that would have struck X but which didn't. So remember, in, in figure B, we've got the pattern that happens, that occurs with two slits. And that bit that's light then goes dark when you add two more slits, additional places for the light to come through. So something's interfering with light that otherwise would have hit X in picture B. Now those, those photons that were heading towards point X, but which don't make it to point X in figure A, when you've got those two extra slits, has been interfered with. Something's interfered with it. That's literally the word. So there's some reason why it hasn't gotten there when it would have got there. Okay, just going back to the book. Whatever causes interference behaves like light. It is found everywhere in the light beam and nowhere outside it. It is reflected, transmitted or blocked by whatever reflects, transmits or blocks light. You may be wondering why I'm laboring this point. Surely it is obvious that it is light. That is, what interferes with photons from each slit is photons from the other slits. But you may be inclined to doubt the obvious after the next experiment. The denouement of the series. What should we expect to happen when these experiments are performed with only one photon at a time? For instance, suppose that our torch is moved so far away that only one photon per day is falling on the screen. What will our frog observing from the screen see? If it is true that one interferes with each photon is other photons, then shouldn't the interference be lessened when the photons are very sparse? Should it not cease altogether when there is only one photon passing through the apparatus at any one time? We might still expect penumbras since a photon might be capable of changing course when passing through a slit, perhaps by striking a glancing blow at the edge. But what we surely could not observe is any place on the screen, such as X, that receives photons when two slits are open, but which goes dark when two more are opened. Yet that is exactly what we do observe. However sparse the photons are, the shadow pattern remains the same. Even when the experiment is done, one photon at a time, none of them is ever observed to arrive at X when all four slits are open. Yet we need only close two slits for the flickering at X to resume. Could it be that the photon splits into fragments, which, after passing through the slits, change course and recombine? We can rule that possibility out too if again we fire one photon through the apparatus but use four detectors, one at each slit. Then at most one of them ever registers anything. Since in such an experiment we never observe two of the detectors going off at once, we can tell that the entities that they detect are not splitting up. So if the photons do not split into fragments, 
and are not being deflected by other photons. What does deflect them? When a single photon at a time is passing through the apparatus, what can be coming through the other slits to interfere with it? Let us take stock. We have found that when one photon passes through the apparatus, it passes through one of the slits, and then something interferes with it, deflecting it in such a way that depends on what other slits are open. The interfering entities have passed through some of the other slits. The interfering entities behave exactly like photons, except that they cannot be seen. Pausing there, just my reflection. Just a psychological reflection. So I think at this point, this is where the sense of vertigo really begins to happen. It's, it's, you're recognising that he is, David is offering for you, served up on a platter, the explanation. There are photons there that you can't see. Now, at this point, you don't understand the full explanation, but you're getting a hint of it. So everything can be understood at this point. Everything is logical, realistic. It makes sense. You're not having the wool pulled over your eyes. At no point, at least for me, do I have questions and go, but wait, what, what about, what about, what about? Because he's answering any of the objections I might have raised. If you have any objections throughout this, please write a question in the comments because I, I like to talk about this stuff. It's, um, it's very interesting to try and clarify if you're not too sure. Let's keep going. David writes, I shall now start calling the interfering entities photons. That is what they are. Though for the moment, it does appear that photons come in two sorts, which I shall temporarily call tangible photons and shadow photons. Tangible photons are the ones we can see or detect with instruments, whereas the shadow photons are intangible, invisible, detectable only indirectly through their interference effects on the tangible photons. Later, we shall see that there is no intrinsic difference between the tangible and shadow photons. Each photon is tangible in one universe and intangible in all other parallel universes. But I anticipate what we have inferred so far is only that each tangible photon has an accompanying retinue of shadow photons and that when a photon passes through one of our four slits, some shadow photons pass through the other three slits. Since different interference patterns appear when we cut slits at the other places in the screen, provided that they are within the beam, shadow photons must be arriving all over the illuminated part of the screen whenever a tangible photon arrives. Therefore, there are many more shadow photons than tangible ones. How many? Experiments cannot put an upper bound on the number, but they do set a rough lower bound. In a laboratory, the largest area that we could conveniently illuminate with a laser might be about a square metre, and the smallest manageable size for the holes might be about a thousandth of a millimetre. So there are about one trillion possible hole locations on the screen. Therefore, there must be at least a trillion shadow photons accompanying each tangible one. Thus, we have inferred the existence of a seething, prodigiously complicated hidden world of shadow photons. They travel at the speed of light, bounce off mirrors, are refracted by lenses, and are stopped by opaque barriers or filters in the, of the wrong color. Yet they do not trigger even the most sensitive detectors. The only thing in the universe that a shadow photon can be observed to affect is the tangible photon that it accompanies. That is the phenomena of interference. Well, pausing there. So at this point, I think I understood interference and you should understand interference as well interference is these photons that you see colliding physically colliding with these photons that cannot be seen these photons that cannot be seen push aside the photons that you can see because if they weren't there then the photon would have just continued off through that double slit and landed in one of two places behind those two slits that's the single photon version of reality the classical universe version of reality. But that's not what we're in. We're in a multiverse. Back to the book. We're almost there at where we have to accept the explanation of the multiverse. David writes, Shadow photons would go entirely unnoticed if it were not for this phenomena and the strange patterns of shadows by which we observe it. Interference is not a special property of photons alone. Quantum theory predicts and experiment confirms that it occurs for every sort of particle. So there must be hosts of shadow neutrons accompanying every tangible neutron, hosts of shadow electrons accompanying every electron, and so on. Each of these shadow particles is detectable only indirectly through its interference with the motion of its tangible counterparts. Pausing there. Okay, so at this point, I think I accepted the multiverse account because I knew about doing the twin slit experiment with electrons. In fact, I'd read about 
uh, it being done with oxygen atoms. So it's clear, it was clear to me at this time, that, well, not only do you have this retinue of photons following around every photon you can see, you have a retinue of electrons following every electron that you can detect and oxygen atoms, and therefore you just conclude that, well, every single particle of matter has a retinue of unseen counterparts. So that's it. We live in a multiverse. We live in a universe, a reality, where much of it is unseen. Which again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an astonishing fact, but it's also consistent with the history of ideas, of the universe just getting larger and expanding beyond what we can see. The seen, in terms of the unseen.